last day of the week. I don't know who says that. I don't. But okay. So today we're going to talk about speciation and behavior. We're sticking around the level of individual organisms, and uh, still thinking about a couple of different principles. Before we get into that, though, let's warm up and look at this graph. Think about what's going on here. So extinction or something like that. Because we are on speciation behavior, so it might be. But then speciation is the creation of more species. So okay. I feel like it might be too closely related to species. They're probably just behavior. There's some, some major spikes there. Population. Population could be. How would you explain that to me? How would you monitor mating habits? How would you monitor the mating habits? Are you talking like offspring born? Yeah, so you think so you don't think that's years Spain, you think that might be a uh, year Spain? Oh, I think it's over a long period of time. But if it So you could look at the red being maybe maybe more population. Where the blue is All right. something else. Like. So here are lots of really great observations. Would anyone like to share? Yeah. With the whole group. Get some new contributors. Troubadour? What? Contributors. <laughs> Contributors. Yeah. I you said troubadour. As usual, no right or wrong answer. I hear lots of guesses about what it might be. There's no way for you to know. So what do you see? Yes. <laughs> the red has more spikes. How would you define a spike? Like it just rapidly goes up and then down. Okay, so there's a rapid increase and then a very sudden drop off. And you call that a spike. I think that's a good way to describe it. Thanks. Else? The blue looks gradual, maybe lacking spikes. Yeah. Yeah. Except for decreased spikes, there's a few of them. There might be some decreased spikes, like there's a what would an anti-spike be called? I don't know. We could we could come up with a name for that. A trough, if you will. A dip. Good. Uh, we're circling around a couple of pieces of information to point out here. One is that there's two sets of data plotted on this graph, at least based on the idea here that we've got different colors and uh, they're plotted separately. Would you all agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so from a very basic sense, we're looking at two pieces of information potentially here. What else? Anything else? Uh, I heard a good observation back here that I'm going to build on. Uh, are, are these lines parallel to each other, or do they cross? They cross. Do you remember what parallel lines are? Yeah, side by side. Uh, Thursday, early February, you know, Mall, Nebraska. 
so they wouldn't touch, right? These two lines seem to cross. Uh, the other way to think about that is that they're not following each other along here. So if you plotted these two pieces of information together, they wouldn't necessarily be correlated. Would you all agree with that? Okay. Anything else that you want to point out about this? All right. Feeling warmed up? Feeling good? All right. Let's get let's get into it. So these are the two um, principles we'll be talking about today in most detail. We're still talking about evolution, uh, and we're going to cover specifically the idea about how evolution organizes these systems into hierarchies. What's the very tip of that uh, branch? What's that called? That's called the species. So we'll call it. We'll think about the species concept. And then the seventh principle, I'm starting to get into a little bit today, uh, just based on how individuals interact with each other in ways that influence their abundance. Just specifically, how behavioral ecology is a study of different ways that uh, organisms interact with their environment and what that means. <coughs> the specific topics we'll cover include phenotypic plasticity, We'll then dig into a couple of case studies looking at eco-evolutionary feedbacks. We'll then cover the species concept and speciation, as well as the flip side of speciation, which is extinction. And then we'll cover behavioral ecology towards the end. I'll note that, you know, once again, we're going to cover these topics in some depth today, but we could spend the entire semester just talking about the species concept or evolution or eco-evolutionary feedbacks, or indeed behavioral ecology. I think at one point we offered a class here in the biology department that was called behavioral ecology. We have a behavioral ecologist, uh, Dr. Claudia Router, here on the faculty. So this is something that, if you're interested in it, um, something to think about. All right, so phenotypic plasticity. Before we talk about this concept, I want to remind you about what is a phenotype. We talked about this on uh, Tuesday, right? So the phenotype is the expressed or physical attributes that we can see of a genotype, right? So the genotype is what we can't see. It's kind of underneath the surface, under the hood, if you will. The phenotypic plasticity is what we can actually observe, those traits that we can see. Like when we talked about the nullus lizards, their toe pad area, or their femur length, those would all be phenotypes that we can go out and measure and see. The phenotypes is very dependent on genotypes, although as we'll see right now, phenotypes can have some plasticity to them, which means that sort of the cut and dry, black and white thinking about evolution as um, something that happens between generations uh, is maybe a little bit fuzzy if we think about it in this way. So this concept overall, uh, in a nutshell, is looking at the change in the expression of a phenotype as a function of an environmental cue. It sometimes refers to as adaptive differentiation, which is different than adaptive radiation, but uh, anyway, we'll go over that in a little bit. To think a bit more deeply about this idea of phenotypic plasticity, I'm going to show you a study that was done um, in the late 90s using, again, the anolis lizards in the Bahamas. This is a nice, uh, what we call a model system to think about some of these questions, where in this setup, they set out to figure out, can we induce this phenotypic plasticity in anolis lizards? To do that, they experimentally introduced lizards from one island to islands that were previously unpopulated by these lizards. The islands also had the, um, uh, vegetation that was different on each of the different islands. So the two criteria for these islands in the experiment were they couldn't have these anolis lizards on them beforehand and they needed to have different types of vegetation. So by different types of vegetation, things like shrubs versus trees or basically the height of that vegetation. They chose the source population that they've been looking at for several years, and then they looked at and tracked these experimental populations where they introduced them to new islands over a decade or, or more, so 10 to 14 years. Their hypothesis was 
that they were going to be able to document changes to hind limb length in response to changes in the vegetation structure on these different islands. So that was their hypothesis. Their predictions were that the experimental populations would have changes to their hind limb length that correspond to vegetation structure on the experimental islands. And their second prediction was the relative hind limb length compared to their body size would be related to the perch diameter. So how, how um, wide or how thick are the, the uh, branches that these lizards are hanging on to? Does that correlate with their hind limb length? So this, the length of these uh, appendages or legs on these lizards, does that correlate with the thickness of these uh, branches that they're hanging on to? Does that make sense? Are we on the same page in terms of the experimental setup here? Okay. So here's the data that they show to suggest or build the case that these experimental populations had changes to their phenotype in response to vegetation on these islands. Okay, so let's walk through this graph because it's a little bit um, unconventional and how it's displayed. What we have here is vegetation height in meters, but it's increasing in this direction. In that on this side we have lower vegetation, so like shrubby vegetation that's kind of low to the ground. This would be maybe um, you know chest high or so. And then on this side of the graph we have higher vegetation. These are between two and three meters. All right, and then the, on the y-axis, our response variable, this is the morphological distance. What they mean by morphological distance is how much did that hind limb length change compared to the original population? All right, so they, they had really good information about this original population on this island where they had these lizards. They took the average hind limb length from that original population, and then they compared it to the new highland length of the populations on each of these islands. That means that each of these dots represents a different population of lizards on each of the different islands that they were introduced to. So if we look at the morphological distance, we see that the islands with lower vegetation, which is more dissimilar to where the source population came from, had larger morphological distance compared to the ones that had, were on islands that were in, had similar types of vegetation. So in other words, these islands were closer in terms of the environment and the lizards stayed relatively the same. The ones that were living on islands that were different from where they came from showed stronger morphological distance and bigger differences in their hind limb length. How'd I do, did I explain that okay? Pretty clear? All right. The second line of evidence or a second prediction that they tested was, does the relative hind limb length and the perch diameter are they associated with each other? They circled the original population on this axis, or this point right here, and then this is the perch diameter in centimeters, and then we have the relative hind limb length on the x-axis. Okay, so relative hind limb length is compared to the overall body size, right? We'd expect a bigger lizard to have bigger legs already. So relative to its body size, the original population had pretty large legs, that were lining up pretty well with the perch diameter from where they came from. If you look at the rest of these islands, what's showing is that where they had smaller perch diameter, their relative hind limb length got smaller and smaller. So they were responding to the available environment in which they were living, and this response was measurable in terms of the phenotype. 
it's important to recognize that the genotypes of these lizards not necessarily change, right? Maybe minutely. But what's changing visibly and measurably, we're able to detect, is a change in their phenotype in response to an environmental cue, in this case, vegetation structure. All right, pretty cool. So there's plasticity in the phenotypes that we see in as little as 10 to 14 years that we can go out and measure. Does that make sense? Is your mind sufficiently boggled by that? Good, just check. Um, so here's another mind-boggling aspect of phenotypic plasticity. Other environmental cues can cause the kinds of shifts in what we see, what we observe in terms of phenotypes. This is a really great example with Daphnia, which is another model ecosystem, or not ecosystem, another model organism that we can study these types of changes where uh, many Daphnia reproduce asexually, and so they have these are clones of each other, right? So they're identical genetically. But one of these, Daphnia, was exposed to predator cues, and the other one was not. Any guesses as to which one is which? Non cues. So the one on the right looks like it was predator cues. The one on the right? Mm hmm. It so we have stick one up. vote for the one on the right. Responding to predator. I think there's one on the left. Okay, we have a vote for the one on the left responding to a predator. Also one on the left. Another vote for the left. Okay, I'm seeing some nodding heads. So if you are thinking left, you are right. Uh, and that's because we see these horns on the staphnia, and that is a response to the predator. So while these two are genetically identical, so they have identical gen genotypes, their phenotypes are wildly different in response to this environmental cue. All right, so another example of phenotypic plasticity that can happen uh, without changes in that genetic material. All right, so there's some, some fuzziness when we're thinking about evolution and change through time. Certainly this could develop into something that would be you know, perhaps a um, something that could be selected for or things of that nature. But we're talking about phenotypic plasticity here that's happening in a shorter amount of time than what happens at evolutionary time scales. So when we're thinking about this concept of phenotypic plasticity, I think a central question that remains unanswered is, is this evolutionary change or is it simply an environmental response? So what we need to know to demonstrate this is that this is actually an evolutionary change. In other words, how can we find the underlying mechanisms for gene environment interactions that result in phenotypic plasticity? This is a remaining challenge and open research question in ecology and evolutionary bi biology, right? How do we scale between the the idea of a phenotypic plasticity response versus uh, a true evolutionary response. How do we define that? What's the gray area there? What's the nuance? So hopefully I've introduced that um, in a way that doesn't confuse you, but, but one that gets you thinking about this idea that there is plasticity out there, and when we're thinking about evolution, we need to consider that as well. So that brings us to this next idea of eco-evolutionary feedbacks. And eco-evolutionary feedbacks are the idea that ecology and evolution are gonna be acting in tandem all the time. And that there's a prediction that phenotypes are gonna have differential effects on the environment, right? So the phenotypes of these longer limb length there's ways that we could conceive that differences in limb length could potentially affect vegetation. Um, there's ways that we can think about this predatory response affecting rates of predation, for example. So what changes in phenotypes are going to have different effects on the environment and vice versa, right? So it's not just 
a one direction process where the environment affects phenotypes, we can also think reciprocally about how phenotypes affect the environment. And that's what these eco-evolutionary feedbacks are all about. So let's talk about a couple of examples of this in action. This is an aquatic example. There's certainly terrestrial examples out there. Uh, it's just one that I happen to know about because I tend to think about freshwater more than anything else. But this is an example looking at alewives, this little, uh, little critter here. The, it's a fish that commonly spawns in lakes on the East Coast. Some of them are what's known as anadromous, meaning that they migrate from the ocean back to lakes to spawn. And then some populations are not migratory, and in fact, they're landlocked into lakes, and they do just fine as well. So they're they have able to do both, live in the ocean, and then come back to lakes to reproduce, uh, whereas some populations are living in those lakes all the time. What this sets up is a natural experiment where you could look at differences in the eco-evolutionary feedbacks that occur in landlocked lakes that contain these alewives all year round versus lakes that only contain them seasonally because that's when they come back from the ocean to spawn. Okay, so do you all see the difference there that we can start looking at differences between and comparing? All right. The other key piece of information here is that alewives are visual predators. So you have this big old eyeball right here and they use that to find prey that are going to be extra tasty. And they selectively feed on large body zooplankton like Daphnia that I showed you earlier. Okay, so they're going to go looking for these zooplankton known as Daphnia. You can see Daphnia with the naked eye if you just go out to a lake and scoop up um, a jar full of lake water. You will find these, they're called water fleas commonly. They're jumping around, you can see them. So can alewives. Okay? There's other zooplankton out there that are much smaller and perhaps less of a uh, good source of food for these alewives, and so they really do zero in on larger bodied zooplankton like Daphnia. The differences in the migration patterns that we see set up differences in predation that we could measure in terms of the Daphnia. So what we might predict is a landlocked alewife that lives in the lake year round might uh, phenotypically change to the point where we can see differences in the zooplankton community that they're feeding on compared to lakes that are connected to uh, the ocean in some way and don't have alewives all year round. Right. Did I set this one up okay? Any piece that's unclear? So as I mentioned, these migratory alewives are going to be feeding on zooplankton for one spring and summer season. The young of year of these fish will migrate back to the ocean. The landlocked alewives feed on zooplankton for several generations. And so we expect that to involve uh, generational changes that we can measure uh, in these fishes. So here's the evidence that they're showing to, to look at these eco-evolutionary feedbacks in these two different types of lakes. And what I'm showing you in these two graphs are um, the zooplankton biomass and the zooplankton size in terms of their length. The top graph shows the biomass, the bottom graph shows their length. So two different ways to look at the size of the zooplankton that are living in these two types of lakes. The open symbols on this graph show the migratory alewives and the closed diamonds show where they had landlocked alewives in these lakes. So what these data are showing is that the biomass of zooplankton in the landlocked lakes stays relatively similar from spring to summer in both cases. Okay, so there's not really a difference in the size of the zooplankton as we're moving from season to season, only in landlocked lakes. The big difference that we see 
is in the migratory lakes where they had migratory alewives. The alewives come in in the spring and then they chow down on all the biggest zooplankton such that by the summer, all the zooplankton that are really big are gone. The only ones that are left over are the small zooplankton. Okay, does everyone see that? So we've got in terms of biomass and in terms of length, the zooplankton community is smaller by the summer in the migratory lakes, especially compared to the landlocked lakes. Another way we can look at this is with the phenotypes of the alewives in these landlocked versus migratory lakes. The alewife phenotypes for the predation morphology in the migratory lakes are shown again with the myself here with the open symbols so that's here the landlocked populations are here so what do we notice in this graph what's happening to both the gape width so how big is their mouth and then they also will use their gill rakers to feed on these zooplankton and filter them out of the water essentially what's happening to the size or the phenotype of basically the way that they eat. Is it getting larger or smaller? For the migratory, or I'm sorry, the landlocked populations. So these right here. I'm hearing it whispered, maybe. Let me ask one more time. When we're looking at the landlocked populations, this closed symbol right here, how big is their mouth and gill rakers compared to the migratory population? Smaller. It's smaller. It's smaller. Thank you. <clears throat> so that means that the phenotype here is shifting away from a larger mouth size to one that is smaller. And the evidence suggests that this is in response to the uh, overall smaller sizes of zooplankton year-round that are happening in these landlocked lakes. Does that make sense? Okay. So uh, to kind of wrap up this example, the biomass and body size of the zooplankton in these lakes the zooplankton are key herbivores, meaning they eat all the algae and plants that grow in uh, the water column of these lakes. Their biomass and body size can influence the amount of algae that's in the lake. Okay. Zooplankton biomass was lower on average in the anadromous lakes, or the migratory lakes, <coughs> and they observed that phytoplankton in those, those lakes with the migratory fish, the phytoplankton tend to be higher as a result because uh, there were fewer large-bodied zooplankton around. Uh, to put this another way, what we're seeing here is how an eco-evolutionary feedback between two populations of the same kind of fish are having an impact on not just their population, but what they eat, and then what their prey eats as well. So it has this kind of cascading effect that goes down from the fish, to the zooplankton, to the algae, all driven by these eco-evolutionary feedbacks that I think are pretty fascinating. All right, uh, and again, just to summarize what I just said, the differences in the phenotypes of landlocked versus migratory alewives can influence the populations of zooplankton, and that potentially results in cascading effects that indirectly affect the entire ecosystem by these changes to herbivory that happen through the zooplankton. All right. Any questions about that example? So let's talk about the species concept. So how are species distinguished? 
Right, we talked about artificial selection and uh, you know domesticated dogs uh, on Tuesday. As a quick reminder, despite all of the diverse morphological traits that we have in uh, dogs, they're all the same species, right? Mm -hmm. But then we also find different species that look morphologically identical. And then we also have this to deal with as biologists. What, how do we define this lizard, which is a hybrid of this species and this species? Okay. So how are the species distinguished? This is a, a you know, one of the big questions in biology, perhaps something that you talked about quite a bit in bio two. Um, we'll talk about it today in the context of, again, how evolutionary uh, uh, systems are, are organized into these hierarchies with species kind of at the very end of that branch on the tree, if you will. So one species concept that I want you to be familiar with is uh, what's known as the biological species concept species concept, and this was introduced by Ernst Marr in 1942. Uh, in essence, what this states is that in order to define a species as a species, it must be able to interbreed and then produce viable offspring. Okay, so this interbreeding holds these species together genetically into the same species or hierarchical structure that we've been talking about. A lack of interbreeding then would cause populations to move apart genetically and then eventually into what we would define as new species. All right. Have you all heard this concept before? I don't too. Okay. Now there are several challenges potentially with defining a species in this way. One is how, how do we define the mechanisms of reproductive isolation? Reproductive isolation is often weak in plants, especially ones that are uh, going to pollinate by wind, for example. And then hybridization is another thorny issue when you're talking about biological species concept. Right? So we have two different species that do interbreed but then produce something new. How do we define that? Other species concepts are certainly out there. I want you to be aware of them. Um, Another one that you're probably familiar with is phylogenetic species concept. This is where we can use differences in morphology to distinguish species. But again, there's challenges with this as well. Uh, how do we determine just exactly how much difference is needed to say that this is a species versus this is a species, right? So how much difference is enough difference to compare the two to actually say that they're different? There's also the evolutionary species concept. And this is where you can use analysis of ancestries to differentiate species. Uh, and there's also an ecological species concept. So the idea here is that we can take species and then look at where they exist from an ecological standpoint or what's known as their niche, right? So the set of temperature, pH, uh, moisture, productivity, you name it. Any kind of environmental variable you can think of where they exist is going to define them as a species. So the presence of different types of habitats, different environments, and then the organisms we find there, we can use that information to define the species. You can imagine there's challenges with this as well, um, which we won't go into, at least not today, but I want you to be aware that we can define species that way as well. All right, how are we doing? Anyone need a break? We push forward. Okay. Stay with me. I know. This is species concept, riveting stuff. Okay. Speciation and extinction is the next thing we'll talk about. So if if we're defining species as these interbreeding, uh, producing viable offspring, uh, working on this hierarchy that's developed through evolution, how do we go about defining when a new species actually emerges. What is this idea of speciation? And then on the flip side, how do we tell when something has gone extinct? 
So a perhaps a more concrete definition of speciation that works from the idea of uh, the biological species concept is that we have a new species happen when there's an irrevocable separation of populations into different species. It's the end result of evolutionary processes working together over usually millennia in which different gene pools are developed as a result of mutation, genetic drift, and natural selection combined. So all those ways that we violate the assumptions of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, when we have those things happen over a long enough period of time, such that there's an irrevocable shift into new genetic material, that would be, by definition, our uh, speciation as an end result. Now, as you might imagine, this irrevocable shift would often require some kind of isolation to occur. And uh, using, again, the biological species concept, the, uh, there needs to be a barrier to that interbreeding in order for the speciation event to happen. There's many different ways that we could think about reproductive isolation happening. They're all shown in this diagram here. And they involve basically two different types. One would be grouped into prezygotic barriers or you know, pre-fertilization. Uh, and then the second group would be the post-zygotic barriers, which would happen after the offspring are born, but then the next generation uh, would not be able to produce viable offspring. So the prezygotic barriers, I think, are fairly intuitive to think about. One, of course, would be habitat isolation. So do we have two populations that are the same species, and then eventually their populations are isolated in some way, such that they can't physically interbreed. Um, temporal isolation is another one, where perhaps two populations start to emerge of different species because of differences in um, their, uh, you know, maybe one becomes more nocturnal versus one is diurnal, or there's differences in their phenology or seasonal patterns in their abundance that isolates them reproductively. A third way that they could be isolated is through behavioral isolation. And then of course, we can also think about mechanical isolation and gametic isolation. Those would also be prezygotic barriers where there's no interbreeding happening because of uh, these physical attributes or traits that don't allow mating to occur. All right? Questions about any prezygotic barriers in defining those? Okay, so for the postzygotic barriers, this is again the case where uh, interbreeding can happen, but in the offspring, there is reduced viability of the hybrid. So they're not as fertile, let's say. They aren't as able to reproduce for whatever reason. Um, that would be uh, two different ways that you have post-zygotic barriers occur. And then the third would be hybrid breakdown. Okay, so again, there's a, a viable offspring that's born, but they tend to be less fit, or they aren't able to uh, reproduce as well, or they simply break down um, even after they're born or the next generation is, is happening. So those would be uh, examples of post-zygotic barriers. Any questions about those? So this is, this is basically the level that I'm expecting you to know about these. Just understand that we have both prezygotic and postzygotic barriers that can occur and be able to at least mention a few of the different ways that either one of them could happen. Okay. So from there, this prezygotic versus postzygotic barriers, a lot of the ways that we talk about speciation um, comes about with thinking through ways that populations are going to be isolated, and we have certain names that we call these types of isolation depending on how they occur in nature, okay? Um, so these three different ways that speciation can occur are known as allopatric, parapatric, and then sympatric speciation. 
to me, the most intuitive one to think about and the one we have the best sort of examples from nature that we could talk about is allopatric speciation. And it's illustrated in this diagram by having uh, this oval shape here representing an original population of some organism or plant. Uh, well, yeah, some plant or animal, whatever it might be. And then there's some kind of physical barrier that's formed that's an initial step of the speciation process. There's then prolonged isolation where there is uh, evolution that's happening on the two sides of this barrier. And then eventually we have new genetically distinct species to the point where if you uh, reintroduce them to each other in some way, they can no longer interbreed. All right, so that's allopatric speciation. For parapatric speciation, this builds on the idea of an ecological niche in that there's no uh, isolation occurring from a physical barrier as we see in allopatric speciation. But now the isolation is happening because there's a new niche that's entered by this species. Right? So again, we start with our original oval population of plant or animal, whatever it might be. And then there's some kind of change in the environment or change in the trait of that population of species that allows them to enter into a new niche. So perhaps uh, uh, you know, a trait comes about that allows for uh, uh, using shorter vegetation, let's say, or uh, whatever that might be. I can't think of a great example off the top of my head right now. Excuse me. Um, we then have enough of an isolation in this new niche where the previous, or the original population can't follow this kind of offshoot population uh, into that new niche, and therefore you have reproductive isolation, and then you eventually, through evolutionary time, get a speciation event happening. The third example is sympatric speciation, and arguably this is a more controversial idea uh, in that there aren't that many detectable examples in nature that I'm aware of, uh, and there's some debate about whether sympatric speciation really happens at all. Uh, but theoretically, it could happen where perhaps you start with your original population, there's some kind of polymorphism that occurs, uh, there is then a population of a new species that forms within that same population, and you still have reproductive isolation that eventually occurs towards the end of the speciation process. Okay. Let's go through some examples of this uh, in more detail, moving away from kind of the nebulous blobs in that diagram to examples of allopatric speciation that occur. Uh, again, allopatric to me is the most intuitive to think about because it involves something like a valley, like this one, where you have the same species of flower growing in alpine regions in the valley and then on the other side of the valley in a different mountain range. Perhaps over evolutionary time, uh, glaciers melt and sea levels rise. You then have two populations of the same species of flower that now live on separate mountain ranges and they are not physically able to um, reproduce because of this a large canal in between the two of them, or a large bay or inlet, whatever you might want to call it. And then once sea levels might recede, uh, there's no longer uh, the ability for this plant species to uh, interbreed after uh, the speciation event occurs. Uh, I do have a video for you to look at allopatric speciation in salamanders in California. Now. Evolving over millions of years to adapt to different environments. 
would change so much when they are on their way to become an entirely separate species. David Wake of the University of California, Berkeley, explains. The history of the species complex began about 10 million years ago in the ancient redwood forests of Northern California, where we have today the swamp pico, which is highly variable both genetically and in terms of coloration. There were two migratory groups followed by animals as they moved into Southern California. One along the Sierra Nevada mountain chain, where animals moved into the forest region, the other along the coastal mountains, they avoided the Great Central Valley. The populations that gradually moved down the forest region of California relied on blending in with their environment. Animals with good camouflage tended to survive more and produce offspring of similar traits. As the salamanders progressed south over millions of years, the markings became more distinct. The end of the chain in Southern California, we have this one, Fabri, which is the uh, extreme of variation, showing the largest blotches most bold markings. These were all then camouflaged organisms that were hiding from predators. Along the coast, a different strategy was followed. Here, the organisms adopted the color pattern and behavior of dangerously poisonous nymphs, and they became, instead of camouflaged, they were advertising their resemblance to these dangerously poisonous animals and gaining the advantage because of their mimicry. So what happened is that you had two differently adapted lineages moving to the south. And by the time they reached the southern end, they had essentially evolved into different species. But at certain areas, for example, in the Palomar Mountain area in San Diego County, you get these animals, which are hybrids. And the hybrids are neither similar to dangerously poisonous animals, they're not good mimics, nor are they good animals in terms of camouflage. So these organisms are essentially dead ends. These hybrid offspring are not well adapted to their environment and are therefore less likely to survive. The two parent subspecies that produce the hybrids are well on their way to become an entirely separate species, evolving just as Darwin described in his theory of evolution. I think Darwin would love this example because it shows exactly the sorts of patterns that he was talking about. Gradual adaptive divergence, leading eventually to the establishment of these species. Wix is your platform to. All right. Any questions about allopatric speciation? Okay. I have another video for you to show how. Uh, this is an aquatic example, but in this case, the physical barriers that exist in this river are, are ones that you might not think about eventually. Like you usually think about a river and the water being connected all together, and that fishes that live here could interact with fishes that live upstream and vice versa. But in this particular example, they don't, and we'll talk, we'll look at why that is uh, here. is that it isn't just a, a band of water. It's an highly complex hydrological system. And in that unique stretch of river are found some of the most extraordinary fish on earth and the most incredible numbers of species of fish. Now we think, it's our hypothesis, that it's that complexity of hydrology that's really the key to understanding why there are so many different species of fish here. To me, one of the most important things is, when we look at these rapids, I want to know how deep all of that goes. Because, you know, it's possible that that could be a surface phenomenon 
and it may well be that for the fishes here, they can swim underneath that. I don't know, and that's exactly what we're going to find out with this equipment. Why not? We're setting up the instruments to start recording data. Everything gone, we're just setting a file name for the echo sounder. It's, it's all powered, all running. It's, uh, we got about 20 seconds and we're half a off. <laughs> It's a completely blind, depigmented, cichlid fish. We only ever find them dead, we never caught one. They just wash up dead because we think they're living very, very deep down in the canyon that's out there in the river that Ned and John are gonna be mapping for us. They're gonna be able to tell us exactly how big the canyon is and how deep it is. Velocities at the surface going in one direction extremely fast, go down to 100 meters, and they're going extremely fast in the opposite direction. <laughs> so there's this cacophony of water and mountains and troughs. It's a wild, wild place. And what we think is really happening is this tremendous river topology is actually serving to isolate fish populations. And that's really weird, because we always think rivers water, and if you've got water, a fish can swim in it. So you're going to have no difference from one side of the river to the other side of the river, because fish can swim across. Turns out not to be the case in the lower Congo. There are certain species that we're looking for, so we will sample the tissues of those first. Ooh, look at this. So this is 218. Okay, so then I'm going to take a fin from which we can extract DNA. We get some specimens from this side of the river. We look at them. We say, oh, we know what that is. We go to the other side of the river. We collect the same species. We look at the specimens. We say, oh, it's the same thing. But when we go back to the lab, we start analyzing the DNA. We find, no, 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 they're not the same thing, they're distinct. Once we have acquired all of 
this genetic information, we're able to reconstruct trees, relationships for these species that suggest that the diversification in Lower Congo is ongoing. This tree shows the relationships of populations of Tiwi Grama Burchardi collected on opposite banks of the Congo, separated by less than two kilometers. Here, we can view it in a little bit different way. This is a haplotype tree, and each circle is proportional to the number of individuals with the same genetic signal, and the lines represent the distance between them. This says 122. Out of a couple of thousand nucleotides sequenced, there are 122 mutations separating the Le Rapide population from the opposite bank population at Kinsuka. And this is greater than 5% sequence divergence, which is extremely surprising for two populations of the species that look exactly the same. You can see how yeah. complex it is. The water is moving at so many angles. That and at quite high velocities. At very high velocities. It's going to be really great to be able to correlate some of the genetics that Bob's been doing with now what we know about the um, river in this region. Within the trees that we've generated of species found in the lower Congo, we do see a number of patterns emerging that roughly correspond to hydrologic features in the system. And there's a very strong implication that hydrologic features are serving as barriers and driving diversification. Speciation, to a large extent, is driven by isolation. If two populations don't reproduce with each other, then over time, genetic changes will accumulate and they diverge. They may not look that different, but genetically, their genes are clipping away and they're changing. So it's almost as if we're getting a window into that speciation process. It hasn't yet happened with a lot of these fish species, but it's on the way to happening. Species are evolving all the time in this system. That explains why there are so many species there. So really, we have this just wonderful system. It's a magical place. And it's a terrific place for really studying evolution in action. So two examples of allopatric speciation, one maybe that you thought about before with two mountain ranges being separated by water or something of that nature. Uh, another one where maybe it's a little less intuitive to think about barriers happening within an aquatic ecosystem like the Congo River. Uh, but let's turn to parapatric speciation and some examples of that. So uh, the one that I'll highlight here today is with zebra in Africa. This is an example of parapatric speciation where we have different species existing because of uh, differences in their use of niches along these gradients of habitat uh, in, in Eastern Africa. So I'll say about that one. And then uh, again, with uh, sympatric speciation and to some extent parapatric speciation, I have a hard time wrapping my brain around those uh, just in terms of how is it How's it really different from allopatric speciation? And the key thing with allopatric is that there's a physical barrier that you can see or measure in some way. With parapatric, it's more about you know, differences in that habitat and that niche. And then uh, uh, with sympatric, uh, the example I'll show you here is with um, some prezygotic barriers that happen due to temporal isolation in the North American hawthorn or apple maggot fly. And because of differences in the development time of the apple tree that we introduced as a crop versus the hawthorn tree that was used previously by this population of flies, uh, because of the differences in, in the development time of these two different uh, apples, the reproduction was starting to happen at different times where there was clear interactions that could be happening within this population of flies, but they weren't happening because of this temporal difference um, in 
what they used to actually reproduce, which is this apple. Questions about this one? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the previous slide. Sure. So are the donkeys like kind of evolution from the zebra too? Because they kind of look the same, it's just the... Does my question make sense? So, I'm not sure I'm following. I think uh, these are certainly related to other hooved animals, um, including horses and um, you know other ones that we might be more familiar with. But I think in this case, they're still representing a different species on on that tree. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Kind of. Okay. Maybe we can talk after. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other questions? So how long does speciation take? Right? How long does it take before we have a new species? Um, there was a study that was done where they surveyed 84 different groups of plants and animals, and they found the interval between speciation events ranged from 4,000 years to 40 million years. Uh, the, some of the shorter events that we're talking about were for cichlid fish, in the African Rift Valley, uh, the lakes there, and then some beetles took more than 40 million years for new species to emerge. The average time for a new species or a speciation event was 6.5 million years. Speciation rarely took less than 500,000 years. And so the, the upshot of all this is that speciation is a really long process. Something that happens over, you know, millions of years on average, at least hundreds of thousands of years, if we're talking about you know, what's rare, what's an outlier. Speciation and its rates, even though they're relatively slow, thinking about evolutionary time scales, they'll eventually replace all the diversity that we lose to extinctions, but not in a time frame that's relevant to us as humans. So the flip side of the speciation process is, of course, extinction. So let's talk about some characteristics of extinction. It's certainly a natural process. Uh, es estimates suggest that 99% of all known plants and animals that, uh, are now extinct. But extinction rates are currently much higher than at historic levels. Right? And this is largely due to our activities uh, and what that means. There have been several mass extinction events that I want you to be aware of as well. A mass extinction is defined as um, basically something we can see in a geologic time scale that involves a significant adverse global impact to all of the life on Earth. Characteristics include something that occurs relatively rapidly, at least in geological terms. So tens of hundreds of thousands of years relative to millions of years. The event must also have caused a significant number of different taxa above the species level, so losing entire genera, losing entire families, etc. And then the life forms that become extinct should have lived in different types of habitats, so that it really is a global extinction event that's happening. We've had five mass extinction events that uh, we define currently. They're shown here on geologic uh, time scales, and this is our graph of the day. The extinction rates are shown with the red line. The speciation events that are outweighing that are showing the number of families that are increasing through time. So generally speaking, if you look at this graph, the blue line is almost always above the red line. So rates of speciation are at a higher rate than extinction, meaning that we're gaining more species at a faster rate than we are losing them. The key exceptions are, of course, the mass extinction events. Uh, there are five of them, like I said, uh, that occurred here. You're probably familiar with a few of them. Um, one of them 
that I like to talk about is let's see. You know, this one's here 65 million years ago. You're probably familiar with that one. Dinosaur. Alright. So so again, the key things I want you to take away from this graph, when we're looking at this entire graph, most of the time speciation rates are higher than extinction. The exceptions are when we have mass extinction events, and there are basically five of those that we define on this graph. Uh, there's some argument about uh, currently, are we experiencing a sixth mass extinction? <coughs> there's entire books written about this that you can go check out. Um, you know, arguably, we are definitely experiencing species loss at a rate that is higher than in the past. And the other part of it is that most of the extinction is caused by human activities. The patterns of speciation and diversity that we're seeing are becoming, uh, more species are becoming threatened and endangered. The single biggest culprit when we're looking at what is driving the endangerment or threatening our uh, species on the planet is habitat destruction and degradation. So we're looking at this graph here. This is the percent of species that are affected by a single cause. Of course, all these are acting together, but uh, close to 90% of species that are threatened or endangered are threatened and endangered because of habitat destruction and degradation. Another leading cause is uh, invasive species, followed by pollution, which affects about 30% of species, overexploitation, which would be things like overfishing, or using animal products or things of that nature. And then uh, disease is uh, fairly low, but still a, a major cause of threatened and endangered species. So does the habitat destruction and degradation include like wildfires and earthquakes and things like that? So this would all be related to uh, human caused, although if you think about indirectly speaking, increases in, in wildfires, is that playing a role as well? It could be. But I think this is mostly related to um, building farms and cities. Okay. So let's talk about habitat loss in more detail since it is the leading uh, threat to species diversity. Human alteration of landscape and space is one way in which we have an outsized role in competing for space with other organisms. We talked about this towards the beginning of the class. Um, and in most cases, it's related to habitat fragmentation. So if you're thinking about um, uh, populations of animals that live across the landscape, and then we erect some physical barriers or cut down a forest, or change their habitat in some way that is irrevocable and causes detriment to that species, uh, their population sizes might become smaller, and then as their population size becomes smaller, they become more susceptible to genetic drift, and hence the extinction vortex. So this habitat fragmentation links up a lot of ideas we've been talking about related to evolution, the ability of a species to adapt to these changes, and how that's often much slower than the rate at which these changes are happening. Uh, all of that combines to suggest that this habitat loss and fragmentation is the leading cause of species uh, diversity threats. Let's take the second one here and introduce species. We'll talk more about them later on this semester. Introduced species are those that we are moving from their native range into new geographic regions uh, without things like native predators, parasites, pathogens. Quite often, introduced species especially ones that are generalists and have other traits that allow them to spread quickly and reproduce quickly, uh, they can take over an entire habitat and reduce overall biodiversity. Or in the case of a brown tree, tree snake, they can simply eat all the prey that's available and totally decimate those populations. Of course, global change uh, is becoming a bigger threat as well. Um, in terms of how warming is going to shift the species ranges of many different types of organisms, including plants. So we know that 
we talked about this previously, that the current range of a certain organism versus its predicted range is going to shift. Could it shrink? Is that a threat to the species? Potentially, uh, these are things that we need to figure out as ecologists, right? I want to note that global change is not just about climate change. It's also related to things like pollution, which was listed as a threat to biodiversity and species loss. Uh, this includes changes to atmospheric chemistry uh, that have broad global effects on ecological systems. Nitrogen deposition is a great example of this, where we're changing the amount of nitrogen available in the biosphere worldwide due to burning fossil fuels and industrial fertilizers. How does increases in this nutrient have an effect on species and their interactions from an ecological standpoint? These are all big questions in ecology. All right, so I'm gonna leave things there and we'll pick up behavioral ecology next week.